Well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, uh, Forum for giving uh, me the opportunity to be here to impart this seminar um, and um, giving me the chance to, to speak to you. Well, I want to make a reflection on what we want to do with micro-oxygenation, always focusing the treatment of uh, finished wines, especially red wines, as we are going to, or since we are going to do a comparison on uh, how uh, these barrels are behaving, and uh, we want to know what is the uh, functioning active or passive functioning system or working system in barrels and casks. And uh, the passive systems that are being introduced now, rescuing all techniques, as uh, the case that we have just seen. But it is necessary to handle these uh, appropriately because in a few years we will define the dynamic functioning of uh, these barrels or casks as something that uh, is capable of uh, transmitting uh, different materials to the wine through contact, uh, physical contact. And therefore I'm going to focus on these points that I'm going to develop uh, where the main reference uh, is the barrel or the cask, we understand that micro-oxygenation uh, system is reproduced by these barrels. We try to reproduce those phenomena of slow uh, oxygenation with, uh, that traditionally were taking place in wooden barrels or casks. If we want to be successful in this operation, we need to have a control of this micro-oxygenation process so that we can adequate ourselves to this aerodynamic profile that we saw in these experiences that we were carrying out in the latest years. This barrel, I'm going to take two minutes to explain the barrels because it is not always easy to understand. This barrel is a simple one. What you can see here in the graph is an evolution of this speed, uh, the, well, the oxygen entry or intake en ratio. Uh, this is the level of micro-oxygenation micro of a barrel and how this barrel contributes this micro-oxygenation to the wine. So 42 milligrams per liter per year that are decreasing very quickly precisely because wood becomes impregnated, embedded. It is not foreign to contact with liquid and then it becomes embedded or impregnated and the physical conditions where this oxygen transmission are, being, are taking place are changing and because this uh, diffusion in liquid is like 10,000 times lower than the uh, diffusion in uh, liquid, sorry, in gas. And, and therefore, there is a stability stage in this uh, process. In our seminar, we have defined two types of micro-oxygenation, what we call active micro-oxygenation and the passive micro-oxygenation. What is the difference between them? Well, when we perform an active micro-oxygenation, we are following a different behavior to the natural behavior or what naturally takes place in a barrel. We have to handle this differently. And when we perform active micro-oxygenation, micro we are handling Darcy's uh, conduction law, where the driver of oxygenation from outer to the inner environment is done through a difference in pressure. We need to speak about hydrostatic pressure. That is what we all know as pressure. I have a pressurized gas, air, oxygen, whatever, that is traversing a porous matter and gets to a liquid through that porous material, not matter, material. And therefore, uh, it is important to take into account the permeability rate of the material and that's very important because many of the materials have been tested under that modality and not under the diffusion modality, which is what is taking place mainly 
uh, normally in barrels. Here we are also handling uh, pressures, but they are partial pressures, that is concentration, that is the driver the movement driver of oxygen is a movement that is a kind of osmosis, um, as there, are, there is much more oxygen outside, which is a stable pattern in time, a long time, and internally uh, the liquid is consuming oxygen, and therefore the driver is different. We are talking about partial pressures of oxygen, and the property that is uh, here important is the thick diffusion coefficient, and we are talking about important differences in pressure. And therefore, what is active microoxygenation? Following this principle, it is about generating a difference in pressure so that we can inject oxygen so that it can be dissolved in the liquid, which is in this case wine. And from the beginning, there are two equipments that were generated at the same time, more or less. The first one being a very simple system that is based on volumetri volumetry, where there are differences in pressure through a dosification camera and an expansion camera, and we use the gas expansion and the volume increase to generate a pressure, and we will inject that into the inner part or the uh, inner part of the tank through a substance uh, or a porous material like ceramics, for example. This is a very simple thing that is regulated by electrovalves. And this is the dosification chamber. This is it. And this is the expansion chamber and the two electrovalves. Disadvantages. And we have to be particularly careful with the liquid and maintaining a pressure differential which must exist so that the ceramic will not be filled. Uh, with wine. It is a simple but robust system, but we have to be very careful for it to do what we want it to do. And we have this other system, which is a more sophisticated system, which is capable of managing the situation with better knowledge, because it is taking into account the environment that is, the properties, in order to carry out an injection, not a volumetric injection, but the vo we haven't stopped thinking about it, but the volume depends on temperature, therefore depending on the conditions we are in. Injecting volume doesn't necessarily mean injecting always the same amount of mass. Mass is one of the uh, fundamental units in life. So this device can do massic injection because it has a processor inside it which can manage the equation, the basic equation, to know exactly during the different sensors how much mass we are injecting, injecting in the system. It is clear that if we wanted to make a dosing with this device uh, depending on the barrel profile, if you wanted to do that, then we'd realize that uh, using one dosing and then going to bed and hoping for the miracle to take place, that is not going to be the solution. That is, we need to make an adjustment depending on how much oxygen, at what rate, if we want to reproduce what is happening in the barrel. We have seen values of 42 that go down to very low values, but of of course, if you want to manage it, we'd have to modify that rate of dosing, not every day, systematically, but systematic. maybe not every day, but systematically by time. So we carried out an experiment a number of years ago where we tried to reproduce the behavior of a tunnel with, the, with a barrel uh, with the active oxygen injection. So we tried to reproduce the level of oxygen remaining 
saying, the remainder that wine has when it is in a barrel, with an injection that the wine demanding, depending on the parameters we wanted to study, so those parameters uh, were de depended on the dissolved oxygen in a barrel. So we carried out some measurements, the oxygen, how it, did, uh, how it evolved, what it was inside a barrel, and we worked with three types of different barrels, uh, Spanish oak, American oak, and French oak, and depending independently of the initial levels of oxygen, initial levels of oxygen after a number of days, the dissolved oxygen was not beyond 50 parts per billion. So that was very low level. And that those were the set points we were going to use. We wanted to reach even lower values, maintaining a level of uh, um, dissolved oxygen in the tanks where we were carrying out microoxygenation. And so we measured the oxygen every day. We made a correction of the doses depending on the levels we were measuring in each of the places. But apart from that, we were trying to see if on, under any, every condition wine needs the same amount of oxygen, depending on what? Depending on the origin, botanic origin of the wood we were using to carry out that complex uh, uh, aging of wood and oxygen and the size of the, the sizes of the parts of the barrel. We made a different dosification by surface, not by mass. Uh, the difference of doses of, uh, due to the wood we had there, we made a measurement of the surface, the wood surface surface that a barrel has around 202 square meters, 225 liters, so we need to measure the surface, which became the amount of mass when we were analyzing the wood. So the, the results were very really surprising because we let the wine demand as much oxygen as they needed to maintain the same amount of oxygen when they were in the barrels. So when we started adding up the amount of vinyl oxygen we had dead it all, uh, all the time. Surprisingly, we saw that there was a classification or a ranking of the doses of oxygen claimed by uh, wine, depending on two of the variables that we mentioned, depending on the size and depending on the origin of the wood. So it depending on the wines uh, with uh, uh, splinters required less time, those with each had uh, um, slabs uh, required, even if the surface was the same, the wood, when it was in touch with it, there were some variables which were different, so we were, and we were not taking it into account. So it also depending on the variety of the origin of the wood, the needs, the uh, wine to digest the, com the elements of the wood, it was not the same. So we learned that if we wanted to make microoxygenation, we can't always use uh, the the device with the same uh, dosing depending on the size the, of the wood and depending on the origin of the wood, it had to be different. So we noticed that everything which was ruling was the size that basically required twice as much oxygen if you used the slabs instead of uh, splinters. So with this, you can think that with my active microoxygenation, we could reproduce what is happening in a barrel if you wanted to adapt because we had a tool which which obeys our orders and to change the dosing, we had to do that. And then we have pa passive microoxygenation, which is something we did not manage because it has a permeability value to oxygen, the materials we need to see now, materials which are uh, on the market, which we know and we've measured. So we'd have to think of what can we do to achieve a situation of dynamic dosing of oxygen, which apparently we have seen is necessary because once demanded and that we've proven that that is the way it takes place on in barrels. So first of all, let's look at the ma natural materials among which we have all the ceramics, terracotta, grass, which goes a little beyond cement, uh, which is concrete. Of course, it is not material, but it is not a synthesis product either. Uh, uh, then we'll talk about stone and wood. There are wood containers which are not barrels, so we have to know them, how they get to work. So 
de la cerámica del grés for incluso, ceramic and grass, um, de there's a slight de, de, lack of definition of what we consider bueno, to be lo, each of the products. The most important de thing define, that defines the difference between terracotta and grass is the composition with which you achieve those products, whereas terracotta are made from clay, the technical ceramics and grass are made with uh, clay mix, mixes which are sought to find the adequate mixes and the cooking or the, uh, the elaboration temperatures and there's these um, baking ramps which are firing ramps, the firing ramps and then there's uh, concrete, it's an agglomerant, there's particles, it's a formula and as such it is open to different formulas and uh, there's a management of the material to achieve those permeability values that we might want. We look at the values because there are not many available and some are contradicting and then we have stone. There's no um, watertight material in nature, but it is one of the most watertight because it's used in the industry of nuclear energy to um, store nuclear waste due to its very low permeability. We're not talking about new materials. Uh, not long ago, it was published that uh, vases uh, which were thousands of years old, which had wine inside. I don't know the state of that wine, but it was a material that, was, that had been used from prehistory even to store food and, of course, its evolution. So we uh, shall look at the three types of ceramic we found and we find the classical jars, the mud bars, and then the ongi from Korea, which is what you used for storing drinks and also food, and then kevri from Georgia, which is protected by UNESCO, and it is regarded as one of the main, most, uh, the oldest, one of the oldest materials that is being used for wine storing. The jars, of mud or clay, they have been used for, always being used, they were difficult to use because they're fragile, but with them, uh, winemaking is not wearing us because we're going to take a different approach, we're going to reproduce, we'll be able to reproduce that orig uh, original micro-oxygenation, natural oxygenation that takes place with adequate values, uh, uh, which is provided by a barrel, which is what we use now. I don't know if they're the right ones, but uh, for many years we considered them to be the right ones and we like them. So, as a consequence, what we find on the market, we find a terracotta. They are elements made of clay for wine aging. And the material, they, they have to, the amphoras have to be, to undergo a special treatment because there's a lower concentration that is how they define it, so there's a behavior of a jar where there's a, an evaporative uh, cooling. We know how a botijo works. It is a consequence of the evaporation of the fluid which is permeating through the walls and as such, for its use, that is important, but it is never defined how much oxygen is that inside, what is the rate of oxygen, so we don't know. And uh, just trying them out to tell us whether it is the product which uh, is adequate for the service we're looking for. So when the systems are this way, so we often need to use many different materials to make watertight the objects and uh, keep the liquid inside. And then there are treatments where they're done inside with uh, varnishes, uh, crystallized varnished, uh, so that they are liquid tight. And this uh, clay, terracotta, the characteristic is porosity 
deposit here, the, which allows microoxygenation, not interfering on anything else. But on the other hand, they give us data of what are the adequate values. They don't give us those data. There are some technical ceramics, which is argued to act as wood. It is a perfectly controlled system that no data are provided. Another one. Uh, is uh, uh, data we have about controlled porosity, firing temperature, and microoxygenation data, which uh, uh, vary a lot between 0, 0,4 and 10 milligram per liter per month. Uh, there's no information about the filtration, but that would be a regulation of the oxygen entrance, so it is not clear to us how they work, but we, we use them, but it's important detail here that it, they are based on the lid, which is, because we tested a number of them, not this element, but on the other stuff we talked about, which is the weak spot of this element. So the closing, which we thought was a tight closing, an airtight closing, and it needn't be airtight, but it is not, although it looks. So there's room for a gay, for a flange to be placed in. And then we have the Dolia case, which is a development that took place in 2014, as Justo said, and they want to achieve something which is specifically producing those effects they want, eliminating on one hand uh, the exudation of material and a rate of oxygenation, and in the graph we see here that I reproduce the place of product with a value between 8 and 10 milligram per litre. After many efforts, they managed to change the dosing to achieve those levels. But apart from the data offered by the manufacturers, there's something, some scientific study made to measure, there are very few. We have some in respect of the Onki, the Korean ceramic, its permeability study based on the two types of different clays, different types of physical conditions which reproduce three types of ceramic with different ra ratios of the clay, diameters of the porous, the porosity, the density. We see those are physical variabilities of the material that will tell us how the, it will work with the permeability and the uh, oxygen diffusion. And we also see how they study permeabilities and the finishing of the materials through crystallization. We see pictures of, of the outside. We see the level of finishing is very different when the material is uh, glazed or not glazed. And uh, we see whether the oxygen is going in or not. And we see whether it is good or bad or not. Here we see the data of the material such that is, it is a material that was done with the thickness of four millimeters. It's interesting to know that this study was not characterized. The material was not characterized as such. But the, bar, the packaging may. Uh, with, this, with that material. So there's a discontinuity of material during the, the producing, and uh, we tell us not the permeability of the container, but rather of the material. To leave figures behind and see it better, there's a comparison here of the entrance rates. If we have poros, no glazing with external, internal glazing, or crystal, which would be the paradigm of no oxygen access, but there is access to achieve the level of access which is adequate for us. So, based on those data, we try to transform those uh, permeability data, permeance, which we use to approach the data we have from uh, barrels. So, we worked out uh, the oxygen transfer rate that we talked about based on uh, barrels. So, we considered volume, surface, and so on. If we can made a container of those uh, uh, characteristics with the size of a barrel, the results are surprising. We see, we see that with the two non-treated clays, we have 5 10 centimeter thickness to achieve 40 milligram liter a year, which is very far from what we want.
can be used for other things. If we made a glazing on the outside, then the values would go down. Mix in different clays, then they would go down and would be below the barrier of 20 milligram per liter. And if we do double glazing on both sides, then we'd uh, be controlling the material better. And if we look at the band, which is uh, the values we want between 10 and 20 milligram per year, then working on the thicknesses and on the treatments with those type of clays mixed in the adequate way, then we'd be able to achieve the product with the values we are seeking. So, it is interesting, we go ahead and we we'll see how we must manage that for a dynamic OTR, which we achieve with barrels, but with the other materials we are unable to produce. Then we have grass or stoneware. We've had uh, opportunity to uh, test it. We carried out some tests in, at the university, and in this case, we made a number of measurements with two different gauges, and we measured the dissolved uh, oxygen to the top and the bottom of the, of the bat. And uh, this is uh, a, with liquid, so it was a real situation. And in this case, there was hardly an absorption of liquid, but the material which is uh, permeable to gases but not to liquid. So the value is 13 millimeters per year, gram uh, year, which is acceptable for the profile we're looking at. So it is possible to produce with stoneware, we can reproduce those values we like. We also worked on different dosing of those clays to achieve different permeabilities, which we achieved simply managing in a technological way the production of the product. Natural, natural material, we included concrete. It, we know concrete is a permeable material, they all are, but what its rate of permeability, are they interesting rates? What do manufacturers say? The, most, the four most important manufacturers do not agree. Some say yes, others they say, they say no, others say regulate. They use epoxy resins, which are very impermeable materials to oxygen. And they disagree. Some say they do, some say they, it doesn't, some say they can regulate. So is uh, concrete permeable to O2? Are there conditions that we'd like with micro passive microoxygenation? And it's say by diffusion without applying pressure? No. The essays we carried out are based on applying strong pressure on one side of the concrete and see how much goes through. And this is an essay which is done because uh, uh, concrete is used for presses for civil um, construction and so on and so on. But in our case, we are unable to use those values because they're no use. Nevertheless, they talk about uh, between 550 by 10 uh, elevated minus 18 per square meter, which is a characteristic uh, amount. To say there's a, poss a real possibility of managing and uh, it depends on the water state of the concrete at any point of time. So we can just uh, work out uh, the values for a possible tank with a volume and a different geometry and see what thickness of concrete we, and with those values of permeability, we can achieve the values we are after to make them as similar as possible to barrels. And I say that is the, anyone's choice. Should we use those uh, permeability ranges of your two? Concrete with that permeability would be very far from the values we are using. We're talking about 35,000 milligram per liter per year. So concrete is very permeable, and if a treatment is not done or a specific formulation is done, 
then we want to make our wines to work as one, or we have to do a treatment on the tanks. If we are capable of reproducing these conditions of a barrel with a concrete with a lower permeability on conditions which are similar to that of the barrel, then we'd have to go to thicknesses of 50 centimeters to achieve those 20 milligrams per year. But it appears so the system would be not feasible. We know that is not so. There's tartarization and nepocytic treatments to domesticate concrete, but we have no data measured on what is happening about concrete. Another product that has appeared recently is stone, granite. It is argued that granite has permeabilities and behaviors which are similar to that of a barrel. There are barrel-shaped uh, containers, and there's a German company that makes granite of barrels with a pre uh, thickness of 10, 15 centimeters of the guarantee. They don't give data, but they are sure their permeability data are adequate. They don't, they're not very hot on their guarantee, but they say they're adequate for storing wine. So what can we do with those data? We can take a faith leap, and with the permeability values we know, for granite in different environments from the ones that concern us, they have a low permeability, but we could think that depending on the composition of granite, the origin of granite, we might have Values, we see that the highest permeability thickness of 10, 15, would be around 10, 20 milligram liter. So, granite, if we don't have adequate measures, could possibly be a material that could behave the way we'd like it to. And then we have wooden tanks, which are not barrels, but they can use the advantages of wood in a different way than a barrel does. So, of course, the problems on a joint are there, but the right working of a barrel with a material which is impregnated, we could see the ratio of volume and contact surface because the access of oxygen depends on the surface. There are other things which are interesting on the market. There's an American company. They want to recreate a barrel but using stainless steel, and they argue that similar volumes are to that of a barrel. They say they achieve similar uh, results, but it is impossible because to have the amount of oxygenation cannot be similar to that of a barrel because of the joints in the tool lid and also the surface of wood that has air and uh, wine on the other side is much lower than a standard uh, barrel. Then there's another one which is really interesting, where the technification is uh, sought with oxygenation options, with membranes which are placed in specific areas of this device to achieve a passive oxygenation, in principle not controlled unless we swap the, we change the membrane while the barrel is full. Then we have synthetic materials. Not everyone is in favor of them, based on two materials, which be PDMS and HDP for, for grain. There are pipes which are introduced in the tank, so we use these materials to build the tank so that it is the wall of the container which does the task of supporting oxygen by diffusion from the outside to the inside. The advantage of many of these systems is that they don't use oxygen as such, they use air, which contains 20 percent of oxygen, but they could use oxygen if we put it inside. There's an Australian company called 
Menstar, they use this system for a, a slightly higher oxygenation than a virus because they think they're white because it's more oxygen than they normally have. It is just a stopper with two pipes going in and out. We move the air inside the pipe sequentially so that the oxygen of the air by diffusion, because the concentration of oxygen outside in wine is lower, there's an exchange, CO2 oxygen, CO2 stays inside the pipe and the oxygen from the inside which is uh, 25% goes to white, which has a much much lower value. So you have this oxygenation, this dosing of oxygen, and we tested it. We have to move it with a fan so that it doesn't stabilize, and uh, we have to renew the air inside the pipe. There's a large version of it, a large fat. It is technifying and complicating things a lot. We need a pump. To, and, and tanks, oxygen tanks, and bottles to oxygenate the wine all over the, the, the tank. We have tested this material, we have tested different conditions from those designed by the designer, the producer. Here we only wanted to measure the correlation between the length of the pipe and the entrance of oxygen. We saw that in our situation with our SA, we achieved 29 milligram liter per year. So we make a dosing of oxygen depending on how much pipe we introduce inside and uh, of course there are weak points also there are other tanks we develop we help develop in them and analyzing them a polyethylene container with a pipe inside this system makes a CO2 oxygen exchange so they can provide the oxygen needed for a good procedure of aging when we carried out these tests we saw that the oxygenation levels were much lower than those that they, it was argued for the system to have but the pipe was inside there was no exit for CO2 to accumulate in the bottom part of the pipe so you, they couldn't achieve the amount of air so the solution was to make an in and out of the pipe with the possible breaking of the pipe and emptying the, the, the tank. But the oxygenation rates were close to the desired values and those which were advertised by the manufacturer. And uh, this same concept with the high density polyethylene, which is used to make this tank, and it is the tank, the material which does the oxygen transfer. We have worked with two products by the same manufacturer with different uh, theoretical rates of oxygen access, and we checked, we saw that the behavior is similar to what the manufacturer uh, declares. Some have 109.3, others almost 10 milliliter a year. There are more things to oxygenate our wines, are there? There's a spin-off from an Oakland University, New Zealand. They patented a system because there were very few gaps. It was called Wine Grenade, and they patented a system to distribute through dosing, passive dosing. But it's an active system to carry out the micro situation, the whole tank, with this system, which is based simply on making a movement of the membrane on the pipe through the submarine effect that is empty and filling a vessel which goes up and down, so this system is emptying, fills a wine, goes to the bottom, so we have a movement, a random movement, which is what is really patented to achieve a distribution of oxygen on the whole system in an homogeneous way. Uh, in a uniform way. There's a problem in my view, apart from all that you say, of micro is that the control of this modern system based on 4.0 and the cloud the technology, the control is not in your hands, but it is in manufacturers 
hands you give the data that you can use the device but of course the system is hired and so on i do not share that philosophy but there you have it we'll have to take account and we come to the last main character, the protagonist, which is what we've talked about, services, but not only services, we'll get to talk about mass. We are used to dosifying by mass, but they are neither of them, neither surface nor mass are the solution, because we mustn't forget the word has very different formats, and those different formats, we are going to find that the relationship surface volume of the water submerged inside wine changes totally. We see different surfaces for splinters, cubes, or slats, and the surfaces are very different. We'll see through two crafts based on the principle of uh, soaking of the wood. So using those graphs, we have to decide the couple, volume, mass, and surface. So we have to know when a barrel is in, in contact with wine, one layer of six millimeter is soaked. And apart from talking about the surface index, we should talk a mass index. So we can say there's 36, 37 gram per liter of Wood, which are impregnated, and therefore, if you want to make an extraction of wood compounds, we'd have to look not only for a surface and mass element, but also for, for both things, because when the formats are small, they get totally soaked, and the wine accesses the whole of the wood, but when the format is large, then we aren't always capable of achieving that total soaking, so the internal part of the wood does not does not get in touch with the wine and therefore we are dosing wood but that wood is not being used to release uh, compounds into the wine we have to take that into account and if we do an infograph they're not difficult but they're a little convoluted Difficult to be understood initially, we dosified what the surface would be depending on the mass with a mass dosification. They depend on geometry. I cannot change that. I cannot, not achieving more surface, do, can I put all the mass I want? Because the reference is there, which is the barrel. So with uh, splinters, I could get all the surface, but not all the mass. And here it's quite the opposite. For the splinters, if we have a dosing by surface, we'd see that we'd never be able to, even if we were capable of achieving 90, we said before, uh, it's a superficial index. It, we'll never get the mass we want. And the same would happen with cubes, slats would be a little over, and uh, thinner slats would be too low. So it wouldn't be adequate to work with one centimeter slats, nor with 20 centimeter slats. We'd have to have a, an intermediate value. So we'd have to look for the volume of wood in touch with uh, in contact with wine it is not only chemical elements but also air self-oxygenation which implies using wood which is key to be able to use a, a, a passive max oxygenation system in a consequent way to achieve the effect that takes place in a barrel let's not forget that wood is a porous material we define porosity in a very simple way the gaps within the volume of the wood and it is a pro pro proportion of volume not 50 percent 50 percent doesn't mean the half the volume of that wood is air and the air inside is one percent 21 percent oxygen when it is balanced with the atmosphere around it which tends to balance it all so there are equations equations with, they're not very complicated but they're based on what is the specific density of the cell wall and the cell wall is 153 so we have a of 50% and the half of the volume corresponding to that mass is air. So we could work it out depending on the state of the wood and its value could, what the porosity could be, and therefore be able to 
make an approximation approach to how much air is trapped within the wood, depending on what the density and the water state, which is shown in different colors, so that if we understand that the air is 21% oxygen, then we'd be able to achieve small curves, which where we could see the potential of self-oxygenation due to wood if we were capable of eliminating or releasing all the air it contains to the wine. Something difficult and complicated because when we handle, we manage wood in the barrel format, we have an advantage because there's air in this liquid, so the air is not trapped inside, but when uh, wood is uh, submerged in wine, the physical situation is different because the liquid wants to go in, but there's air which either comes out or is trapped and can be pressurized to a certain extent, so it doesn't always work the same way. So in this situation, how could we, uh, with an active system, we are capable of doing what we want, but we are in control. These are systems where there is an ejection of volume or mass, and so um, with the appropriate management of oxygen, we would be capable of uh, reproducing perfectly what happens inside a barrel. But with passive systems, we see that there is a fixed dose, and this dose, we are not able to modify it, and therefore we can use wood as a system that is able to complete this region that is produced at the beginning, a high oxygen dosification region that comes through the variation of the permeability of wood to oxygen that we could complement with the self-oxygenation of wood as one more element uh, helping to achieve these levels of oxygen that we are looking for that will um, enable us to have the results that we are looking for. As for the conclusions of, for this um, uh, presentation is that well, we have to manage oxygen and wood um, so that we have to control not only oxygen but uh, wood if we um, want to have an active uh, oxygenation we need to also um, count on wood as a system to add oxygen and if we have a passive uh, oxygenation process and we have to count with wood or count on wood as a source of oxygen in fact the micro oxygenation systems both um, active or passive allow us to have this passive treatment without the presence of wood and this is something uh, this is an alternative that is there, out there for us. And the last uh, conclusion would be that uh, we should not dosify wood by their surface or their mass, but uh, as per the part of a wood that is in contact with wine. Well, thank you very much. This is my team, and it's formed by five permanent doc uh, professors and five doctors and a series of postdoc students that are um, doing their work very well. And these are the companies that are allowing us to carry out our uh, conduct our investigation, our research, and they are acting as sponsors. And this is the blog. We are posting news on oxygen or news on wine from our colleagues that are contributing a lot um, when we are going to talk about oxygen and wine. And a lot of uh, what we have presented here is uh, written in a book that is going to be published in both Spanish and English. It has been uh, published in Italian already some years ago by Parsec, the uh, publishing house. And um, we are in charge of the um, translation into Spanish in my group. <laughs>